Uh, hi to all who are t tuning in for this interview. It is a pleasure and a great joy that in front of us we have uh, none other than Neil Kerr. Hello, good evening. Uh, you are a co-founder uh, of a live dub group that need no introductions, I am trained. Thanks for your time and thanks for hanging with us. It's always nice to be in Slovenia. It's always nice to be in Tomin. And it's mostly nice to hang out with Slovenians in my experience. So. Thank You're you. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, you were here a few times already, of course. Mm -hmm. uh, first time, I think, uh, when this whole reggae story here even started. That was in 2003. River Splash. Social River Splash. Yeah. Um, then in Over Jam 2014, again, mm -hmm. you, you performed here. Mm -hmm. uh, tell me, how does it feel to be back, of course? And uh, have you seen any, any country other than here? Tell me. The only country I've seen today is the drive from Trieste to Tommy because oh, right. we had a long day and it was a bit of a hurry. But still, that's pretty beautiful compared to the motorways of Europe. The road up into the mountains to Tommy is pretty beautiful. And the river now and then the mountains covered in trees. That's always nice. You know, it's nice to come back to this place for, for two reasons. Of course, this place has the tradition of a reggae event with River Splash and R Rolando back in the day. And now um, the guys, Fulvio and the guys, and, and Overjohn. But also, I believe and I feel that this place also has some spiritual, mystical significance for uh, local people. So I don't know this, it just feels like that. So I like to come to this place. It's clearly a place of some magic. And I don't really mean the music, I mean the place. Yeah. All right, well, let's basically start. With just you, like Neil, the person, I, I, I read that you you, um, you had a degree in uh, biochemistry. I still have a degree in you, biochemistry. Uh, yeah, you, you, you still have a degree? <laughs> yeah. How come you decided and when did you decide, uh, no, no, wait, I'm, I'm, I'm going to do music? Uh, I did what's the normal sort of pattern of education in, in England if you go to university. I did school till 18 and then I went to university, I went to the University of Oxford. And I studied biochemistry. I studied biochemistry there because I was interested in it. And at the time, the University of Oxford um, had the leading biochemist of the world teaching there. So I figured if I was interested in this thing, I'll try and go to the place where the people who know most about it teach. And I went and I learned it and I enjoyed learning it. But then at the point when I realised that having this degree, if I wanted to be purely interested in this science, the only real jobs available were for ugly situations, then I decided I, I didn't want to do it anymore. So I was interested in learning about it, but I wasn't really interested in spending the rest of my life making someone else money because I'd learned about it, that's not really my thing. And um, I was already, when I made that decision, I was already doing sound system. And so it was quite easy to just stop. At that time I was doing postgraduate studies, you know, so I stopped my postgraduate and just put all my energy into the music. And that's sort of really how I changed. Well, you, you are a self-thought uh, music producer, a composer. Uh, music and the art of making is always a learning process. How long did it take for you to, to make your very first song that you were like happy with? That, that you said, all right, yeah, this, this is it. Well, you know what, I'd put it somewhat, some, somewhat differently. When I started making tunes, rather than just playing tunes, my primary ambition was that I'd make a dub or a tune that would be considered good enough to be played in dub plate uh, in, in, on Shaka sound system. Because yeah. that was a sound system me as a young man I used to follow a lot. So that was like the, the peak of achievement for me. Um, so I started um, Zion Train as a sound system in 88. I started yeah. making the tunes end of 89, beginning of 90. And by 1991, uh, me and my then colleagues have produced a, um, a release called Power One uh, that, that Chaka played in, in session then. So it took about it took about a year in, in the in the making making uh, music learning process for it to get to a, a target that I'd already set myself. And it's difficult, you know, because when you say how long did it take you to get to a tune that you were happy with. I'd say more than 30 years because actually I'm still not happy with any of them if I sit and listen to them in peace. If I randomly walk past the sound system and the DJ's playing one of my tunes, that's different because it catches you by surprise. 
but actually I think it happens with lots of people who perform or make things or put, put parts of themselves into something in their, in their professional life. When you see your work, because you see it or hear it from the position of the person who did it and was very intimately involved with it, then actually you, you're lucky if you see it finished. When I hear my music, I hear mistakes or oversights or I hear ideas that I didn't manage to accomplish. But I don't think anybody else hears it like that. So, you know. Uh, yeah, like, like you said, Power One and Power Two, mm -hmm. um, they both became big hits in 1990s. Uh, in 1992, you released Follow Like Wolves. Mm -hmm. um, that, that album fused like dub and acid house. Mm -hmm. And from then, then on, you were known like as an innovator of music. Mm -hmm. Uh, how did you see it all? Uh, how do you see it all now? And um, what was your source of inspiration? Inspiration back then. Well, inspiration in general is just life. You know? that's what that's what inspires me, and I hope most of the people are aware of the particular idea that inspired the mixing of acid house and dub. Was at the time there were two very um, distinct but similar. Um, free party scenes in England. And one of them was dub in black ghettos in England, played on homemade sound systems. Not the sort of homemade sound systems you see now, real homemade from an old hi-fi in someone's old wardrobe, real handmade sound systems. And that, those parties were very heavy and intense and they served one part, one disenfranchised part of the community who couldn't go to normal nightclubs and enjoy themselves. Like, so the, the, the Caribbean community. But then there were also the techno parties, where they weren't really playing acid house like Detroit, Chicago acid house, but they were playing the new English, more up-tempo acid house, as it were. Um, same thing, but faster. And we used to go to both of those sorts of events, and no one else went to both of them. And what me and my then partners uh, discussed was actually... The energy in these places, created by the music and the way the music catered for the people, was more or less the same. But as there was no crossover, there was no cultural crossover, there was no human crossover, there was no sonic crossover, um, it just felt really weird to us. So we actually got the idea to mix the two music sorts from this similarity in energy in the, in the event. It's a bit abstract, but it worked. For us, it worked perfectly straight away. But for then one year, I had a record like pressed on vinyl already with not really any money to press another one until I sold this one and uh, at that time I, I did all the distribution of our, of our product myself now so I got on my bicycle I had a rucksack I'd go to the record shops in London the specialist shops there used to be lots and lots of them and before this moment I'd been going to the reggae specialist shops so when I went to them with Follow Like Wolves they were all like no we know you but we don't sell house music that yeah, okay so I go to the specialist dance music stops and they'll go, well, we don't know you and we don't sell dub. And so actually we were stuck in this limbo with a thousand records no one really wanted. And then a couple of people, I think Danny Rampling played it, what, then one DJ in New York played it. Because those guys were already established and well-known, then everyone went mad for the record. Which it was great for us at the time, but it's a bit sad. You know? It's a bit sad that someone who's considered a tastemaker has to say, oh, it's okay. Um, but yeah, um, basically you have a long career and uh, you worked with many labels, then created even your own. Uh, uh -huh. Universal Egg, and if I'm not, you also run uh, uh, your one called Deep. Uh, Deep, Deep Root. Root. Deep yeah. Root is vinyl only. Universal Egg is vinyl, CD, and digital. Yeah, is it easier working under your own labels? Well, it, again, it depends. It's artistically easier because you don't have any pressure from a marketing department or an A&R department to shape your music in order to try and sell it. But it's physically harder because you do all of their work as well as being a musician. So it's more liberating, um, but it's probably more hours of hard work per radio play or you know, whichever way you want to make it. At the end of the day, the, the system of uh, commercial record labels is put up to market music and anyone would have to be mad. Look at the way money, money rules the world. Anyone would have to be mad to think that the, the money didn't talk back to the musician and, in effect, change their music. 
which okay, is wrong. That's true. You know. um, yeah, your, your album in 2007 won the uh, Jamaica Reggae Grammy Award. Uh, tell me how, how, how important are those kinds of awards for you artists? Well, it sort of all depends as well. For me then, from the, being from the UK, of Caribbean origin, my mother was from the Caribbean, but from Barbados, not Jamaica. I didn't even know if anyone in Jamaica would listen to our music, even though in 2007 we'd already been going almost 20 years, um, because the scene is very split. Uh, uh, so I was pleasantly surprised that people in Jamaica even knew that that music existed. So for me, that was a personal plus. But then actually, a lot of those awards systems, even the, the, the US Grammys now, they're devices created by the industry to bring public attention to the industry. So it's a bit like the Grand Prix. It's not really something people win, it's something people advertise cars at. No. So it's, there's a mixed, mixed feeling. Of course, when anyone appreciates the music I make, I'm happy, especially if they have the time and energy to come back to me and say, thanks, I like that. But I'm not really sure that I find it more important when, it's, when it gets you an award or it's just a guy or, or a girl in the street who says, I've got your record and it, I really liked it or it helped me. Or, you know, I've got people who say to me, from the age of 7 to 14, my little boy's favourite music was by you. He danced to it every day. So that's more important to me than an award. Because um, that's something really real in, in a real person's life. Uh, and uh, that's, that's sort of the reason, f for me anyway, that's a lot of the reason for doing music, to reach people and touch them in the way that other musicians have reached me and touched me in my life. So it's nice when you see that. And the award helps, of course. It helps professionally, but uh, I think last year was 30 years of your career, career right? In your, in your own career, um, I mean, many bands have ups and downs. Uh, yours went through quite a lot too. Yeah, Tell yeah, me absolutely. Tell me if, if you could, um, what would be your, what, what would be your biggest mountain that you, ha you had to overcome to, to still be here today and to still, still do what you do? Mm. It's an interesting question. No one's asked me that before. You know, I think it's probably believing in the validity of what I do. Because, you know, the reason I'm involved in music is sort of what I said before, but a bit more, a bit more profound. profound. Music's a universal communication medium now. So you can transmit feelings through music, like without language, or music becomes a, a can become a universal language. Um, and uh, the idea that there's some, some, still some validity or energy in that part of what I do keeps me going. So I don't really care if 100,000 people buy my record. Um, I care if I come to events like this, that's good and important. Right. But I really, really care if, like, one person gets why I did a song like, without talking to me, or why even I made an instrumental piece of music and gets the energy that's meant to be in it. That's what I care about, because that's actually really important. Now, we're living in the first time ever where global fascism, global fascism, has actually had the chance of being a pred predominant ideology on our planet. And so what I do and what my life's dedicated to and many other people who work like me and, and do other art is to fight in against that energy, you know, because what we talk about is communication, the similarities between us all, um, you know. I'm um, quite into the uh, idea of a universal consciousness and I try and transmit as much of, of that as I can um, through, through the music we do. And that's the most anti-fascist concept I think you can have now. Because if, if we all think as one, then we uh, can't hate anyone. Yeah, because I know we are running out of time. In, okay. a, month, in a month or so, you will release your new single. Uh -huh. uh, it's called Politrix. Mm -hmm. And in 2020, you plan to release your new album, right? Yes. Uh, il, il, uh, sorry, Illuminate. Yes. Yeah. Uh, can you just quickly tell us maybe something about first the single, what it's all sure. about? Uh, Politrix is... Um, it's a single um, featuring a singer called Prince Jammer, 
um, who's because we feature lots of singers. He's a very good singer, and they, the the theme is basically the manipulation of people through through politics. They think they're voting for personal choice, but actually they're just having every penny of life and, and money squeezed out of them. And the whole theme is don't get caught up in uh, party politics and partisanship, but make politics be the way you live your life. So your food choices, your association choices, um, your behavioural choices, make that be your politics and let's shape the world like that rather than being told uh, what we should and have to do by other people. Uh, and do you know maybe um, in how many songs will be on the album and when it will be released? The, song, is, the song count is 30 and will be released on the 1st of May 2020. All right, so we are, we are looking forward to, to hearing the whole, the whole album and of course seeing you perform on stage. Thank you for your time. You're welcome. Um, it was a lovely talking to you. Thank you. Hi, Neil from Zion Train, shouting out to the reggae.si page. All reggae massive in Slovenia, one love.